Astronomers discovered a new ring system around the dwarf planet Quaur on the edge of the solar system. The rings were discovered by accident as the planet passed in front of a star during an occultation event. But this ring system is really weird because it orbits much further out from its planet than was thought possible. So this discovery may just overturn over 200 years of our understanding of how rings can form around planets. The discovery was announced by a team of astronomers led by Bruno Morgado from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in the February 4 issue of Nature. It's not a discovery of something that anybody seriously thinks is impossible. Rather, it's an opportunity to learn something new. So let's learn about what we know so far. The dwarf planet Quaur was discovered way back in 2002 by Chad Trulio and Mike Brown, and they found the object orbiting at a distance of 43 astronomical units from the Sun. That's 43 times further from the Sun than Earth, and that puts it firmly in the Kuiper Belt, which is a region of small icy bodies that orbit out past Neptune. The dwarf planet is well, it's dwarf. At about 1,100 kilometers in diameter, it's about half the size of Pluto. It was given the name Quaur after the deity of the indigenous Tongvin people of Southern California. In 2007, Mike Brown discovered a satellite of Quaur that was dubbed Wayward, named after the deity's son. In 2021, Morgado and collaborators used the 10.4 meter Gran Telescopio Canaris to probe Quaur's atmosphere during a stellar occultation. And the idea is that as the planet passes in front of the star, the star's light dims a little bit at first as it passes through the planet's atmosphere, and then it finally disappears as the main body of the planet blocks the star. By analyzing the rate at which the starlight dims, and by comparing the dimming in different filters, you can work out things like the atmosphere's density, pressure, and composition. Quaur is small, so the whole occultation lasted for less than a minute. But when they went back and looked at the light curve, they noticed that there were these two tiny dips in the starlight just before and after the occultation. The best way to explain those dips are that Quaur has a ring. Even better, they went back and inspected the data from previous occultations going back to 2018, and sure enough, they found that there were those same pre- and post-occultation dips in those light curves as well. And that makes Quaur only the third small solar system body to have a ring discovered around it. The first occurred back in 2013, when the centaur asteroid Chariklo occulted a star. The light curve showed that there were actually two dips both occurring before and after the main occultation. That means Chariklo actually has two rings, one that's relatively dense and the other much thinner. In 2022, the James Webb Space Telescope detected the rings again in another occultation. Now, this time, the asteroid passed just underneath Webb's line of sight to the star, so it didn't see a main occultation, but it could still detect the tiny dips caused by the rings. Another ring system was discovered around the dwarf planet Haumea in 2017, during another stellar occultation. So rings around small solar system bodies aren't necessarily new, although it's still pretty amazeballs that small bodies like these can actually have rings. But even then, Quarr's ring system turns out to be really strange because it orbits way further out from its planet than was previously thought possible. You see, rings are thought to form when a small body like a moon gets too close to its planet. At some critical distance from the planet, tidal forces exerted on the moon become so strong that the moon gets ripped apart and forms a ring. And this critical distance from the planet was first calculated by French astronomer Edouard Roche in 1848. Now exactly what distance the Roche limit is depends on how dense and how rigid the moon is relative to its planet. But for a typical moon around a planet, the Roche limit typically works out to a distance of between two and four planetary radii. Quaur's ring, on the other hand, lies more than seven radii from the planet. And rings outside the Roche limit aren't impossible per se, but they should be unstable. At that distance, tidal forces from the planet just aren't strong enough to keep the ring shredded. So clumpy regions in the ring will eventually form and start to attract other ring particles. Those particles build into larger clumps, which keep attracting more ring particles until it eventually forms a new moon. And it doesn't take very long to form a moon this way either. A low-mass ring like this should form a moon in maybe just a few weeks. 
Now, the odds of catching a ring that's just a few days or weeks old are vanishingly small. And yet there it is, seemingly present since the first occultation in 2018. So what's going on? Well, there are, in fact, very tenuous rings around Saturn that exist beyond its Roche limit. Saturn's E-ring consists of tiny particles that are expelled from the geysers of the moon Enceladus. Most of the E-ring material is either melted away by sunlight or accumulates on the moons that orbit within it. The only reason the ring is still there is because it's constantly being replenished by Enceladus' geysers. That doesn't seem to be the case with Quarer's ring, though. The ring blocks out just enough starlight to suggest it's densely populated, with icy boulders up to kilometers in size rather than diffuse microscopic particles. So this seems to be a proper, dense ring that's in the wrong place. And right now, it's not clear how you can get such a dense ring to remain stable outside the Roche limit. Any external perturbations should cause the ring to clump up in places, which would lead to accretion, which would form a moon. But there are some possible clues here. One is that the ring may be located near two possible regions where the particles can enter into one of two resonances with either Quarer or the moon Weiwu. Resonances are periodic alignments between celestial bodies such that they exert regular periodic gravitational tugs on each other at repeating intervals. Because the alignment always repeats when the bodies return to the same point in the orbit, the gravitational tug is always in the same direction. Resonances do play a role in maintaining ring systems. For example, let's say there's a particle near the inner edge of the Cassini division in Saturn's rings. When the particle nears the inner edge, it enters into a 2 to 1 resonance with its moon Mimas. And that means the particle completes two orbits for every single orbit of Mimas. With each pass, Mimas pulls the particle closer until it eventually crosses the Cassini division. At that point, the particle falls out of resonance with Mimas and takes up a new orbit in the outer ring. Quarer's ring seems to lie near the inner 6 to 1 resonance with Weiwu. So in that case, the ring would complete six orbits around Quarer for every single orbit of Weiwu. The ring is also located near the distance where the orbital period of the ring body is three times longer than the rotational period of the planet. This is called a spin orbit resonance. The idea goes like this. Quarer is a small body and therefore probably has some kind of an irregular shape. If so, then one side of the planet could exert a little extra gravitational tug on the ring particles as it swings around every three orbits. And this same three to one coincidence has also been found in the rings of Chariklo and Haumea. They're both in a three to one spin orbit resonance with their host planets. So the ring may be in just the right location where either or both of these resonances perturb the ring system just enough to prevent them from accreting and forming a moon. But those resonances should be taken with a grain of salt because we don't yet know enough about Quara's true shape, and we don't even know enough about Weiwut's orbit to say for sure. So we can't say exactly where these resonances really are in the Quara system, let alone whether or not they could be enough to maintain the ring this far from the planet. Another thing is that the two dips in the light curve caused by the rings are roughly the same depth, but they have different durations. And this suggests that the rings are clumpy. They must be more narrow on one side and more spread out on the other. It's reminiscent of the arcs in Neptune's Adam's ring or the clumps in Saturn's F ring. The light curves indicate that Quarer's ring is less than 10 kilometers wide at its most narrow point, and that's about one ten thousandth of the ring's diameter. Collisions in this narrow region should cause the ring to spread rapidly in the radial direction and possibly dissipate. It's very unlikely, though, that we would just happen to discover a ring that's about to disappear. So more likely, there's got to be some other mechanism that's keeping the ring so narrow. In the 1980s, astronomers at the Lick Observatory conducted some laboratory experiments to understand how ice particles in Saturn's rings might behave when they collide. They found that the colder the particles were, the harder the ice and therefore the more elastic the collisions were. Elastic collisions are those that bounce apart, much like the way steel balls do when they collide. On the other hand, 
in elastic collisions tend to stick together, much like the way two lead balls will after they collide. The ring particles should be made of ice, and at more than four times Saturn's distance from the Sun, should be frozen hard as the hardest granite here on Earth. Given the ring's uneven shape and likely hardness of its particles, the team ran some end-body simulations to work out how they might behave outside the Roche limit. And they found that if the particles collided too slowly, their mutual gravity would hold them together, and that would allow them to eventually attract other particles and form a moon. But if the particles collided faster, their collisions would be elastic enough to bounce them apart before gravity had time to hold anything together. But the simulations also suggest that if the collisions were too elastic, then the particles would spread so far apart from each other that the ring dissipates completely. But again, the chances we just happen to discover a ring that's about to disappear like this seems very unlikely. Chances are that the real mechanism that keeps Quarrow's ring stable has got to be a lot more complex. It may involve one or both of these resonances between Quarrow and Weiwoot, or perhaps there are some additional satellites at play there that we just haven't yet found. Or maybe it's just something else entirely. Obviously, there's a lot more observations that are going to be needed to test out these ideas. The good news is that there happen to be some more occultations coming up two in May and one in September of 2023. Those occultations will help to further narrow down Quara's shape and further characterize the rings. As a matter of fact, the James Webb Space Telescope just made a really nice measurement of asteroid Chariklo's rings in the first year of operations. Hopefully, it'll be used to monitor Quarrer's rings in a future occultation during Cycle 2. Webb's Cycle 2 observations should be getting started this summer, so right in time for that September occultation. That would be great if it could happen because there's so much more to be learned. But if nothing else, Quarrer demonstrates that the classical Roche limit may not be the only way to maintain a ring system. My thanks as always to the generous supporters of Launchpad Astronomy on my Patreon, and I want to just take a moment and say, sorry it's been a while since I've made a video. I got a little sick this past January, and I spent most of the month on the couch. What can I say? It happens. But I'm back, and I'm glad to be doing this stuff. So if you'd like to stay up to date with the latest goings on in the universe, make sure you subscribe and ring that notification bell so you don't miss out on any new videos. Until next time. Stay curious, my friend.